a panel discussion with the interaction of the speakers from the country, from the different part of the country and abroad, is will be enriching down to our uh, university. Uh, in the morning, I will like to share uh, uh, a news for our university that our university has been honored uh, with GTV Academic Excellence Award for this year. And the ceremony will be going to, is going to be held on 22nd next Saturday at 7 p.m. in GTV. I am the presence of our Honorable Higher Education Minister, Dr. Patsa Chaganji. Anyway, so here we all meet today at the juncture when the entire world is colonized by a very, very precious virus, the coronavirus, COVID-19. Uh, one good, good thing that has come out of these scary times is that we all seem suddenly to have been birthed into a world that is much more tech savvy, much more digitally conscious than what we knew in the world to be either in the pre corona peaceful days. We are slowly adapting or adapted with the new normal situations. The entire group is now connected to web at any time at any place on any day. So this is an opportunity for us to that we are getting our, our speakers, guests, eminent scholars from around the world. And uh, this is why we are having this digitally held international conversation today on this with the Department of English. I heartily welcome all the business persons, the delegates, and the students, scholars, all the participants, including our registered contemporary examination and other professors, other, other, other officers, as well as respected professors of different departments, and obviously the staff of university. Uh, uh, so, times may be difficult, situation may be adverse, but the heart still dares to live, to dream. Sidhu University has the pattern square and adversity, and come out from positivity, hope, and determination. We have here amongst us in this webinar, eminent personalities like Professor Peter Sivan, all the way from Auckland University, uh, New Zealand, which AM seems to be getting better than most countries in these COVID times. I also welcome Dr. Devastri Dr. Rai from Dalhousie University and others who can too. So, without any more, I welcome you all to this digital platform today. May this event be a grand success. Thank you very much and enjoy the day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, there. sir. Thank you so much. We can see that you have a mask on, you have a face shield on, and you're in the car. But thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for at least making that time for being with us. I mean, you are always such a warm, enthusiastic presence in every event that we have that doing anything without our vice chancellor with us, you know, it's a kind of like unthinkable thing. He has always been there as the, you know, the patron, the godfather of whatever we are doing. So naturally, we had to have him today. So thank you, sir, for making this time for us. I mean, it, I can see how much you are, uh, you know, traveling, you're guarded. I can see the she's on, uh, in front of your face and through talking through that that's uh, i mean uh, an incredible effort thank you very much for that thank now you. we also thank have with us our registrar dr nochiketa bondobadhyay now he is a man from the field of administration as you can very well understand that he's a registrar of the department but i know him as a very avid scholar who studies a lot about a lot of things 
interests which are not exactly in his field of work he studies a lot about feminism he studies a lot about literature culture and listening to him is always a pleasure because all his speeches are well researched well informative and though he was trying to edge away by saying that i'll only speak for 5 minutes i told him that you have to speak at length because listening to you, you to you is such a pleasure we are not going to let go of it so over to you as registrar sir please can you start your speech good morning good morning i convey my regards to professor deepak kumar kaur our respected vice chancellor what the dedic dedication could be for institute how lucky we are tremendous busy schedule today but we never forgot to attend such a digital platform so overwhelmed sir overwhelmed <coughs> i next to i convey my regards to professor peter kegan from auckland university professor yogeshi dotto rai from jadavpur university and i convey my sincere gratitude all the faculty members of department of english our dean faculty of arts uh, dr sudeep bhoi and our ipsc director professor dhananjay rukhit ji uh, it is little scope for me uh, to disseminate something from our uh, local indigenous studies uh, field i want to experience uh, is a little uh, some linguistic movements or what we can do for them i want to tell something a language of minority kuruk of a, a tribal range urao of choto nagpur plateau choto nagpur plateau what uh, our hod uh, just said jungle mahal related geographical area including uh, some parts of jharkhand and bengal uh, orangs are indigenous adivasis of india of dravidian stock anthropologically they are one of the most populous adivasis of india with an estimated demographic number of 3.5 to 4.5 million the second largest adivasi community of the state british ethnographers colonel dalton during 1872 is of the opinion that they might have been original inhabitants of konkan region and in the process of migration have settled in chatrisgarh jharkhand west bengal odisha on exploitation used the cheap labor in colonial india made the migratory people across jharkhand they have their settled agrarian life in chotnagpur around 100 bc up to recent century their language is kuruk having no written ancestral literature just bad luck for some community still we are carrying it adivasi languages in jharkhand belong to two language families jharkhand that is the region of choto nagpur plateau austroasiatic dravidian these two kuruk and malto belong to the dravidian family and the rest to the austroasiatic family kuruk is spoken in the district of gumla simdega lohardaga ranchi and bagmundi jhalda block of purulia district in addition to it in other states of india where orangs are found as chatrisgarh odisha west bengal and assam the adivasi language of india are passing through a very critical stage showing progressive trend of abandoning their traditional languages and adopting languages of mainstream as their mother tongue due to cultural dominance ongoing urbanizations and in the industrialization scholars report underlines that adivasi language as kuruk and kharia are first disappearing from urbanized areas following santali cultural rejuvenation or reformation whatever you say in order to stem the rot and revive the language 
Kuruk language movement also began. For administrative convenience and Christian missionary activities, translation in English from the Kuruk were done by British missionaries. Reverend Bach prepared the grammar of Orang language during 1852. Grignard compiled Orang folk tales in 1931 and published the book titled Orang Folklore, which was followed by Orang English Dictionary in 1942. Han published Kuru Grammar in 1898, Orang Vocabulary in 1900, and Kuru Lokobroto in 1905. The interest of the colonialists further increased, and with the help of a native Orang Dharmodash Lakra, the then SDO of Gumla of Jharkhand, W.G. Archer, Jesuit missionary Han, published The Blue Land in 1940. Kuruk version titled Lil Khora Khefel. Dalton, 1872, Sharat Chandra Rai, 1915. Again, W.G. Archer, 1940, recorded ethnographic riddles, folk songs, folk tales, festival songs, agriculture songs, and wrote about them, including on their customs of marriages, divorce, amusement, youth dormitories, search for suitable right, clinching ceremony, premarital status, and on the condition of Pora women. Linguist classified Guru as a dialect due to absence of script. Surely. It is one of the 33 languages of India with more than 1 million speakers. It is devoid of literary tradition and the entire spread of the language is restored on its orality and oral tradition. Kuruk language activists felt that the development of an independent script was necessary to express their thoughts and documenting their cultural and oral traditions, besides legitimizing their claim of linguistic status. Among the Orao, Narayan Orao and Orao Adivasi tried to develop Tolong Siki script for this language quite late in 1999. The publication on Orao Sanskriti are on the process of continuum and many more. The politics of language of Adivasi communities in India is closely associated with their demand for assertion of selfhood. Selfhood. Likewise, it has been taken politically on behalf of pan Adivasi identity. Educationists argue that the use of the mother tongue can boost the self esteem of marginalized people. Orang society is in a double bind. At one level, Orang linguists are deeply concerned about preserving their language as vehicles of their history, identity, culture, land, and original literature. On the other level, constitutional recognition in demand higher lacking. So it was my little information, and I have shared my experience. But now the uh, thinking is, what can I do for them? What can I do for the proof language in our uh, limited uh, potentiality? So thank you, everybody. <laughs> Hello, am I audible? Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Yes, I would like to thank our uh, registrar sir for that very informative. I would really love to hear a little more from him, but uh, you know, he always leaves you with that um, thirst for more and then he will just uh, <laughs> move away. But listening to him is always such a pleasure and today has not been an exception. Thank you, sir, for doing this. I mean, I really feel fortunate that both our Vice Chancellor, sir, amidst he has had to leave now because he has reached uh, wherever he had to go. So he just um, sent me a message that uh, he, he's taking our leave. So I'm really thankful to him for uh, taking up uh, this platform. And I'm really thankful to our registrar, sir, for making time 
to talk to us about ind indigenous studies it, it was a pleasure sir thank you very much now i would like to request our dean of arts professor shonali mukherjee who like i said earlier is also the director of the center for indigenous studies to say a few words and to uh, you know inform us or rather inform our uh, guests that we have today about what our uh, center is actually all about so over to you shonali Good morning, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Shidukano Bisha University, Professor Deepak Kumar Kaur, respected Registrar Sir Dr. Nochiketa Bandopadhyay, respected Professor Dhananjay Rokshit, Director IQAC, Professor Oparajita Hadra, HOD English Department, our eminent guests and speakers of today's webinar, Mr. Peter Kiven from Auckland University of New Zealand. Dr. Devushri Dr. Rai from Yadavpur University, my beloved colleagues of English Department of Distribute, colleagues from other departments, officers, non-teaching staff, students, scholars. I welcome you all wholeheartedly and convey my gratitude to the faculty members of English Department for organizing this one-day international webinar on indigenous studies, which is very relevant and welcome issue to be presented. I want to deliver here a brief outline of activities of Shidu Kano Bisha University regarding indigenous studies. We all know that SKBU is running successfully a center for indigenous studies since 2019. The exclusive objective of this center is to explore the heritage and culture of Purulia district. After running diploma courses on Chou dance, Chou lack culture, this center is now promoting Purmali language as a diploma course. Departments like Santali, Anthropology and Tribal Studies, Sociology, History, Philosophy, Political Science are connected with their center. We know indigenous studies are now exercised with all these disciplines. Santali and anthropology and tribal studies of SKBU are achieving excellence in academic sector. 19 students of Santali department qualified SET exam 2019. Center for indigenous studies also include manuscriptology and research oriented work on endangered languages. Moreover, Center for Indigenous Studies also contributed its responsibilities during pandemic period through Chou performances. Our coordinator, Dr. Shudhi Bhui, will deliver more information in this matter. Center for Indigenous Studies of SKBU organized one national seminar and two international webinar seminars in the last year. One three days webinar on Kurmali is going to be held from 28th August 2020. Other programs will be materialized soon. I also convey to everyone that Center for Indigenous Studies possesses a beautiful campus in Amchuria within scenic beauty. This is a valuable contribution from West Bengal State Government and District Administration of Purulia. Open air theater, galleries, all are structured perfectly to run it as an excellent academic and cultural center. Except this, all departments of Shidhu Kano Bisha University are including study materials related to indigenous culture of Purulia as core courses and also in outreach dissertation papers. I think this webinar is also an extended activities of Center for Indigenous Studies. I, want, I also want to inform you that our Central Museum, a rich reservoir of cultural heritage of Purulia district, will soon be decorated with a separate room as tribal gallery with clay model models of indigenous people to expand our thoughts 
regarding this matter and which will help our students in many ways. I again congratulate English department for holding this seminar on indigenous studies. I welcome all of you and thanks to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to our uh, Dean. Uh, now I would just request uh, our uh, coordinator of um, the Indigenous Studies Center, uh, Dr. Shudhi Bhui, to say, uh, to say a few words very briefly because since we are running short of time, uh, Shudhi, we need to be very, uh, very quick about it. So maybe just five minutes. So over to you, Shudhi. Okay, ma'am. Uh, good morning to everybody and our respected honorable vice chancellor registrar said dean of arts and uh, director of center for indigenous studies and head of the department of department of english and other faculty members of this department also and our resource person peter kegan and the Dr. Dottorai. Uh, also i welcome here in these uh, events and i am contributing through the prospect of indigenous studies for combat the covid 19 pandemic indigenous people in global perspective and tribal people in India having a free agriculture subsistence based resource utilization technology free Christian worldview uh, communicate through their microcosm based language ILO in article 107 of 1957 and 169 of 1989 made effort to define and provide the universal concept and specifications in course of time, the indigenous studies is getting importance for support academia to trace out the regional version of natural adaptation and evolutionary pathways of civilization. It helps us to compare differentiation at varied degree in integrated aspect of human life with people of then and now. Analysis the troubles and stress due to the avoidance from equilibria between man and nature is another outcome of this domain. Three COVID-19 scenarios of indigenous people where globalization induced problems like large-scale resource mobilizations by commercialized agencies, rapid and uneven unplanned culture contact and encroachments in their beliefs, faith and value-based life, with traditional material culture, socio-economic practices. Before advent of the textual and codified customs, rituals and practices of indigenous life were best suited for maintaining the harmony, solidarity and peace. Ritualistic life brings morality to provide constant source of socio-cultural cohesion. The gradual and multifaceted problems reach the equilibrium of man and nature interaction act as source of constraint, conflict and dilemma. WHO declared them as poorest and vulnerable people of the world. UN system acknowledged the act to the higher rate of communicable and non-communicable diseases, lack of essential services, sanitation, key preventive measures. UNOs having doing the continuous effort to in protect human rights, right to their land, water, social status, protect and preserve their culture. Hence, these people act as instrument to guard the planet's biodiversity. COVID-19 situations hit the miserable conditions of indigenous people into more vulnerabilities. A large number of indigenous people affected and die in Peru, America, Mexico, Colombia, and other Amazon and African countries. Data terrorism creates severe hindrances to recovery and operation services and situations. Whitewashing of history, wiping out the right based territory, culture, language, and habitations are gradually increasing. Harsh condition of India with 103 rank out of 117 countries in global hunger index is hard to capable to protect its tribal people. Reverse migration, social discrimination, disparities, and of course, the politically oriented statistics are serious jolt to the tribal people of India. In our region, Purulia and uh, subsequent regions, during lockdown, they have to depend upon the distribution of food items by voluntary organization and then upon the government's release. Uh, after that, agricultural activities give a little bit of support to fight against these harsh situations. People are extroversive and losing their cultural confidence in free COVID-19 period. Uh, now they turned into the perspective of introspective towards their own culture. This creates tensions in their everyday life and this creates the dilemma 
this storage cannot represent entire scenarios. Indigenous people have been fighting against the COVID-19 with some positive contributions and message to rest world also. Cinco people of Guatemala apply their traditional communication systems to provide essential information. People of Colombia is fighting with their cultural values. Voluntary isolations are very much affecting to bridge the chain of infections. Summons of Amazonia Basin are playing vital role to reducing the infections. Besides of these, our traditional taboo and ritual sacred behavior obey the social norms are very much effective to combat the situation. In spite of large range of problems, indigenous studies may provide the experiences, knowledge, idea and inputs to policy level measures and contributions in the research and development in this high time. Our Center for Indigenous Studies is uh, doing effort for harmonized with the rest disciplines and ex expect the future uh, to reach the mankind in natural world with excellence. Thanking you to all for accommodating me this valuable times. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vui, for your presentation. And now we are heading towards the uh, technical session of this particular um, webinar, in which we have a panel discussion. And in this panel discussion, we have three eminent distinguished scholars. First, I would like to introduce to you uh, Peter J. Keegan. He is a senior lecturer in the School of Maori and Indigenous Education, Faculty of Education and Social Work, University of Auckland, New Zealand. His areas of research and teaching mainly focus on Maori or Indigenous language, literature, and education. Peter's current research projects involve Maori or New Zealand English phonetics, developing Maori speech tools and tools for measuring early Maori language literacy. He undertakes international collaborations in which Indian scholars are also involved. Out of these academic activities, he is also interested in family, languages, reading, travel, and especially traveling in India. What is very interesting that with all these, he is an avid fan of hiking in New Zealand's mountain and national parks. Welcome, Peter. And our next speaker is Dr. Debosri Doctorai. She is an associate professor in comparative literature and deputy coordinator, Center for Canadian Studies at Jadavpur University. <coughs> She has been the recipient of a Fulbright Alumni Award in 2019, the Shastri Mobility Program at McGill University, CICOPS Fellowship at University of Pavia, Italy, a Fulbright Nehru Visiting Lecturer, uh, Lecturer Fellowship at UC Berkeley, the Erasmus Mundus Europe Asia Fellowship at the University of Amsterdam, and Fulbright Doctoral Fellowship at State University of New York, Stony Brook. Her areas of research and publication are post-colonial studies, indigenous studies, education, gender, narrative, comparative Indian uh, literature, methodology, and folklore. She is author of The Oral Tradition of Northeast, a case study of Carby Oral Tradition, which was published in 2015 and has co-edited at the Crossroads of Literature and Culture, which was published in 2016. Next, following Forkhead Paths, Discussions on the Narrative, it was published in 2017. Our next book is Ecocriticism and Environment, Rethinking Literature and Culture. It was published again in 2017. And she has been issue editor for a special volume on indigenous studies for lit grit and Indian response to literature. Welcome, Devasu. And last but not the least, we have Dr. Nivedita Mukherjee amongst us. She is our own Nivedita, 
and within our circle she needs no introduction actually then also i'm going for it she is a professor in english at sridhu kanu bishwa university purulia she specializes in feminist studies indian english literature and shakespearean drama professor mukherjee has five books to her credit to name a few gendering the narrative gender discourse and indian english fiction 2015 dynamics of diasporic identity in commonwealth literature 2013 the dark forces in shakespeare's play 2013 etc professor mukherjee also has international teaching and learning experience she has received the us state fellowship award sui for study of US Institute on Contemporary American Literature in 2017 The program was hosted by Seattle University Washington and was funded by US Department of State Bureau for Educational and Cultural Affairs She has served as the editor of two reputed journals namely Wellesleyan Journal of Research and International Research Journal and Appropriation the journal of the Department of English Bakura Christian College she is working with teaching learning center IIT Kharagpur as research collaborator and subject expert in a project titled graphic novel graphic novel based pedagogy in teaching grammar in school so funded by MHRD presently she is also working on an ICSR funded project titled folklore and folk voices conserving the environmental ecosystem i welcome you all and over to nivedita ji for the conversation we are waiting for so long well i would like to thank dr jyoti shankar mondol but uh, he is uh, very close to me and those words are uh, like uh, i don't know what to say about them but i feel very very happy to have amidst me today two people professor uh, dr peter keegan and dr deboshree dottore with whom i have been working since 2012 on various issues related to indigenous studies indigenous research and all these areas now i would like to before really handing over to them i would like to speak a little bit about our association how it was formed and where it was formed because that is very interesting too when it comes to indigenous study it was in 2012 in an international conference that is a series of conferences were held in fact from 2008 onwards known as chhatro now this chhatro term is itself taken from the bheel vocabulary of central india and it means coming together and when i say coming together you will understand that this chhatro meet in 2012 was actually held side by side with the international language meet where 800 different languages were represented the representatives of these languages were present there and many of these languages were indigenous languages some of whom i had not even heard about now this entire thing was a collaboration between the bhasha research and publication center headed by professor ganesh devi again someone who needs no introduction in collaboration with the european association for commonwealth literature and language study headed by professor geoffrey davis during this chhatro program the conference we interacted but of course as we know there were people from different places all over the world many of them representative of indigenous communities 
That is how I came to know Peter. But it happens that even when there are a number of people, a few gel together. That was the case between Peter, Deboshri, and myself. Well, it is not saying uh, it is not saying more when I say Debushri spearheaded always all these interactions. She is a very active person, as you might have heard from the number of Fulbright scholarships she got and her publication. Okay, so she is always very positive and she brings us together just as today's program brought us together. In fact, with Deboshri, I have also been connected with the Center for Canadian Studies, which is again a part of the Comparative Literature Department of Jadavpur and coordinated by Professor Shuchorita, uh, Professor Shuchorita Chattopadhyay, and uh, Dr. Deboshri Dottore, and an interesting feature of this conference, you will understand why I am referring to this particular and uh, these series of conferences held by them because it is held in collaboration with the Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute, and every year. A special prize is given to the best research paper, of course, up to the level of PhD. The best research paper, the prize is known as Renate Eugene Broad Memorial Prize for the best research on the indigenous communities or indigenous aspect of Canadian literature. So there again, we got to talking. Peter had been coming over. In fact, Peter was gracious enough to come over to Bakura Christian College when I was working there. And I remember the lovely session which all our students attended. And Peter enthralled them by talking not only about his indigenous roots, about the Maori community, but also, as I was discussing today, by singing in his own language. I still remember that melody. I can never really forget it. And now I would like to hand it over to Peter Keegan to kindly speak about the COVID situation in his area in relation to the indigenous community. Thank you. Peter, please. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much for those warm words of welcome. And also, please extend my thanks on to uh, your VC, who unfortunately can't be with us. Uh, also, my thanks to the Register uh, for his words and also very, very interested to hear those that have talked about the research that they've been involved in uh, locally and um, that it kind of um, brings my mind back to my time um, in Bakura, which was only um, last year. Um, um, thanks also for Professor Hazra for, for uh, enabling us to get together and bringing us together um, for this particular time. And it's a real uh, privilege to, to be a part of the seminar. Um, I, one of the things that um, I want to point out to um, some of you is that um, I'm a, a long time observer of India. Uh, first visited India way back in 1987. Um, and for someone that comes from a long, long way, believe me, India has changed uh, and is changing very fast. And thinking about today's topic um, and, and what's happening to indigenous communities in places like New Zealand, around the world, I, I would think that to me that that would be one of the key theme, themes that that we need to hang on is that in today's world 
um, when we have unusual situations like COVID, all of a sudden, um, community change can be very, very quick. And I'll give some examples of, of how that has happened as I kind of talk. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for about um, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, point out some things. Um, then we'll go on to Deborah Shee, come back to Nebidita, and we can carry on in a conversation uh, type thing. Um, and just thinking about um, what Professor Hasra has mentioned um, several times that one of the things that, that happens whenever we've got an unusual situation, and for example, COVID, is that there is always um, a, a silver lining. And certainly that's been the case for us in New Zealand in the sense that um, earlier this year and right now as I'm speaking, we've gone into lockdown, which means that students can't attend schools physically. Um, that's no longer allowed. Um, and what that's meant is that um, schools have had to um, resort to online type teaching, Google Classroom, um, online type methods. And so what that's meant for um, um, a lot of our teachers, and particularly those that are involved in Indigenous education, is it meant that when it comes to doing things, when it comes to uh, providing materials, is that um, they are doing things in front of a screen, very much like we're doing now, um, but not having that face-to-face -face interaction with students and um, knowing quite often that um, what they're saying is going to be recorded and students are going to listen to things, watch things in their own time, and then there will be follow-up conversations. Um, things will be said, things will be understood, but there will be questions raised about, about what's being done. And those of us that have been doing things online, um, one of the things that, that we do is look at what we've done and kind of think quite often, yes, that, that was okay, that was fine, but um, could we do things a lot better? Could we improve the way that we're doing things? Could we improve the way that, that we've recorded how we've done things, um, if we're using slides, um, what is the right time, what is the right balance. It, it's meant that as teachers, we have had to, we've been given a, a mirror in, in which we can look at um, in terms of, of, of teaching. So that's, that's kind of a silver lining thing. Um, I just want to point out um, one or two things about, about New Zealand um, when it comes to our response to COVID that, that might be um, slightly different to other countries. Um, we're a very small country a long, 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 long way from everywhere. New Zealand only has 5 million people. Um, and to get to New Zealand uh, from Calcutta, it's a four and a half hour flight to Singapore and then around about an a eight hour flight all the way down to New Zealand. Um, and so unless you're visiting by ship or by plane, um, it's not an easy place to visit. The other thing I'll point out about New Zealand is that up until very recently, up until um, really the 1790s, early 1800s, there was one indigenous group living on the country um, on both islands. And so only really one language spoken. Um, obviously, that, that's changed a lot um, because uh, cities like Auckland, are, um, very much like Australia, Canada, the US, um, we, in re recent times, over the last couple of decades, we've had a lot of migration from around the world, um, Asia, um, even India in, in recent times. So we, we are now um, very diverse in the sense that um, quite often you can go into schools in, in, in Auckland 
Um, and if you ask what languages the students spoke, you might get 40, 50, 60 different languages from all around the world, and in addition to um, Māori as an indigenous language. Um, so one of the things that we worried about when COVID first came up in New Zealand is you, you think about we, we've got something that, that's going to impact on um, us as, as an Indigenous group. What might have happened in the recent past and what can we learn from it? And the big thing that people talk about, and they still talk about, um, was what happened um, in the Spanish influenza epidemic. Um, that goes way back to 1918. And what happened in places like New Zealand, it was devastating, very much around the world, it was devastating for indigenous communities. The indigenous death rate was something like five times the, the non-indigenous death rate. Um, and and, and that, that's kind of borne out with COVID. If we look at um, indigenous people, um, and it's um, that that get infected with COVID and in, in, in New Zealand right now in Auckland, um, we've got a cluster of infections that that are mainly Indigenous people, um, simply because of the of our history, of our DNA. Um, those types of diseases will affect us much more dramatically than other groups, and, and that's simply a, a factor of DNA of our history. It doesn't matter where you're living right now or, or, or where you eat or something like that. So um, we knew that, that, that COVID could be potentially devastating. And so what happened in New Zealand in some of our rural communities, um, groups blocked the roads. They set up roadblocks. They blocked people coming in to the communities. And they said, look, um, we're, we're susceptible to diseases. We are only letting um, those come in that belong to our community. We don't want outsiders because if we get this disease, we don't have any medical facilities. Um, it will be devastating. Now, interestingly, those roadblocks were illegal. They, the police could have come and dismantled them. But the police kind of said, yep, that, that's kind of a legitimate thing to do. Um, and that there is there's kind of a validity in doing that. Two other things I'll point out about New Zealand that's helped us with COVID. Um, one, we, um, our Prime Minister um, is a 40-year-old a female. We have a female Prime Minister and very well thought of, very well respected right across the community. And the second thing is that currently in New Zealand, people listen to scientists. Okay, what happens in New Zealand every day, the Prime Minister makes an announcement and she is talking with her chief science advisor. And they are well respected in New Zealand in terms of should you be wearing masks? How should you go, be going about isolation? Um, we don't have to deal with a, a lot of um, people saying that this virus is a conspiracy. Um, it, 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 people are telling you um, a whole lot of untruths about that. So um, there is a lot of respect for the government, for our Prime Minister. There is a lot of respect for um, the, the scientific community and telling us what we need to do to prevent this virus being spread. Um, so, so that's worked in our advantage. Um, in terms of um, some of the unusual things that have happened right now um, because of COVID-19, um, New Zealand relies on tourists a lot more than India. In some places, some towns um, in New Zealand Tourism can be up to 80, 90% of income. Um, and so if we think of um, uh, there are some islands that are, are currently isolated outside of New Zealand called the Cook Islands, um, they're 90% reliant on tourism. All those people are, are out of work. That won't recover. 
Yes, those people can fish. Yes, those people can plant crops. They, they won't starve. But the locals in places like that are saying that once we open up, once people can travel, our young people are going to all go elsewhere, all go to the cities. They ex expect that there's going to be a mass migration of young people simply by the aspect of, of not seeing any future in tourist type jobs and knowing that they've got relations in the cities and places like New Zealand where there are much better education uh, property, uh, possibilities and, and chances for employment. So this, this, this is again, I, I keep mentioning things could happen very quick. And even for some of my own students, I've, I've had a problem with um, students that should be coming to class have actually picked up extra work and to, to provide extra income. And I want to say to them, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be attending classes because once you finish classes, these are, are sometimes these students are, are trained to be teachers and um, they will, their income will be a lot more if they qualify as a teacher um, and work in the New Zealand education system. Teachers got a big government pay rise um, two years ago, and, and, it's, and it's quite a, a well-paying occupation. So students that, that could have picked up employment, um, done things that, that, yes, it might provide them with short-term income, may help their families, but um, while they're taking up employment, they're not turning up to class, they're not complete, completing assignments, um, and it's slowing down the education. So I probably stop right now um, but I, I will say that um, when it comes to uh, our teachers of Maori language and, and teachers of um, indigenous languages that um, we have seen a some very very spectacular online type of um, teaching sessions um, and making resources available that people can use in their own time rather than being reliant on class times. And, and so there's been a lot of innovation um, and people have had the time because they've been locked away at home to record what they're doing, get feedback and do a better job. So I think we are better at, at doing things online. Um, but um, we have a proverb that um, talks about, uh, it, it, in Māori it goes kānohi ki te kānohi. It, go, it talks about face to face and being there in person is, 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 is of paramount for learning. So we know that we've got this um, and, and that, yes, it's much better to, to do something face to face. Um, rather than rely on the online situation. Um, just before this meeting, I came from a, another online session at the University of Auckland. Um, there, uh, there were, it was a Zoom session. There were 2,300 people on that session. Um, that's, um, it's, it's, um, and so what that's meant is that for someone like me, um, instead of attending class every hour throughout the day, quite often it's online sessions um, moving throughout the day. Um, but so it's meant that, yes, we've had to think about ourselves as teachers. We've had to think about ourselves as learners. Uh, we've had to think about ourselves as, as, as people that, that are living in lockdown uh, with, with, with your wife, with your children. Um, and interact. Um, one of the things that, that happened to me um, in lockdown, and it was our lockdown was very strict, um, I, I told my students it, it was my birthday. This was in April. And so what the students did, and they, they broke lockdown, they came and visited my apartment, and they brought me a birthday cake. And, uh, uh, and this was um, a, a very... It's kind of a, a, a thing that they did. Um, and I said to them, look, you guys really shouldn't be um, um, 
um, breaking lockdown to deliver this birthday cake. So what I did, I took a photo of the birthday cake and then sent it around to all my fellow colleagues and say, this is what my students have gone out of their way to deliver. So, so that's kind of a, a, a silver lining. Um, I think we've learned a lot more about our students, who will stay, who will go. Students have surprised us um, and during this lockdown. I kind of think that's enough from me at, at this time, but I'm quite happy to pick up on other things as others comment. Thank you. So, Nibedita, will you take over? Peter, that was very uh, enlightening. I mean, Nibedita, uh, unmute yourself. Oh, okay. So, thank you, Peter. It was really nice listening to your experiences of lockdown. I heard about it that your lockdown was very strict. That was something actually maybe you people were able to control this pandemic better because of that. Because in India, though there was an official lockdown, but we can't really say that it was very strict actually. Because, and that may be the reason why the numbers multiplied and multiplied to an extent where today we are jumping lakhs actually practically jumping lakhs so we don't really know what will be happening but as our hod ma'am also said and peter also stressed upon it we have to look for the silver lining in the crowd and now uh, well let's see let's hope the silver linings get more and more brighter so that the cloud vanishes. dissipates uh, at least uh, that is what we can keep our fingers crossed. And in the meantime, we can really be thinking about ways to collaborate, to uh, think, you know, hearing these things, that uh, lockdown, how strict it is, and what is the impact of it. I think these kind of interactions itself makes people more aware rather than the dictums of the government. Just the government yes. dictum. This so, works better. So now I would like to Peter, go over uh, to Devoshri. Yes, Operator. If, if I might just butt in with a point, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when Peter was talking about how the students, uh, you know, stood up uh, during the lockdown and brought you uh, uh, things, you know, at home. I would like to say that my students over here in Shibukanu, you know, the students of our department have also been very productive, you know, surprisingly productive during the lockdown. I mean, uh, there was one point of time, uh, you must have heard of Rabindranath Tagore, you know, he's almost like the, we swear yeah, by him. Yes, so no. when his birthday came up, you know, my students came up with a wonderful collage. So all the students recorded bits and pieces from their own homes. And there was this wisecrack guy, called Arindam, Dan, or Arindam Shin, who put it all together. And it was a wonderful collage, you know. So we normally uh, do it offline. We normally do it with uh, lots of songs and music and things. And it was still done, but digitally. Then again, on Shakespeare's birthday, you know, they uh, wrote poems about Shakespeare. They wrote their own feelings about Shakespeare, then bunched it up into a collage. And it was a, uh, uh, they called it a collage wall. So that was wonderfully done so our students came out with there's this young guy called proloy roy he draws so well and he churned out painting after painting during the lockdown you know so they did try to yes. live up to uh, life as much as possible even though they were locked down at home yes nivedita yes uh, so now Hearing from Peter about the situation in Auckland and Greater New Zealand, if you if we got, get it, I would like to go over to Debo Shri, who has been working for a long time, longer than I have met her, on different indigenous communities. And now her special area of interest is the Northeastern, the Seven Sister States. She is actually looking into an area which I must say almost apologetically we have ignored for a long, long time. So Devushri will now be speaking to us about her experiences 
about the impact of the pandemic on these northeastern states and globally, almost a comparative picture. So over to you, Deboshri. Thank you, Nivedita Dee. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Hazra. Thank you to Vice Chancellor Sir. And I was really very happy to see so many people coming together because I know it's a very difficult time for the universities all over India to actually manage time out and do this kind of thing. I'm also very grateful to the Registrar Sir and also Madam Mukherjee and my colleague Dr. Bui for bringing out so many interesting aspects on indigenous studies. And especially it was a pleasure to hear about the Kuruk language and the kind of interdisciplinary work happening at SKB. So in fact, uh, for me, I think this was why we were so wanting Peter to visit SKB because it would have had ha given him an opportunity to actually look at indigenous studies in practice in the in a particular part so close by it's so close to calcutta but it's it also is so intricate and varied in different ways uh, what i'm going to do today is that i will of course what i found very interesting is the whole idea of how students and their networks have changed with the pandemic i think one of the things that we've been denied during the pandemic is sitting in the classroom but what has happened in return is that different methods by which students have educated us through these very difficult four months. So I think, and also more so ahead. And I think that is something that I take away from the pandemic as well. Uh, when I'm going to the uh, communities and other aspects, I, I'll begin with a certain PowerPoint and I'll see if I can show that to you in a way. So I hope you can see the PowerPoint over here. Yeah. It is there. Yeah. There was yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, so this is, of course, one of the images that I wanted to see, which is amazing. Uh, Amazon defender Gloria Oshiga, who has been leading struggles in defense of Sapara territory against fossil fuels, defense of language, and women's rights. Now, why do I bring about this? Because if you remember the, our initial images during the lockdown, one of the first things that we talked about and spoke about was how despite the traversity of COVID-19, that despite all the turmoils of COVID-19, it seemed that nature was living again. And it, of course, brought us back to the indigenous ways of living. And nature was getting a break, finally, from us. So what we have to recognize is that way, the way of seeing the world, the way of seeing the world is drastically different from, for instance, a Western capitalist growth-driven system. And it's rooted in a value system that talks about knowing the world around you, knowing nature around you, knowing different ways of learning how indigenous people are working. For instance, uh, there is this report that came out in uh, 2019. It's called the Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And it was released by the UN Intergovernmental Panel in Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is known as IPDS. This was brought out in 2019. And what uh, Dr. Lilek, Vassour, president of the Canadian Commission for UNESCO, tells us is we are running out of time and options unless we immediately and fundamentally transform our relationship with nature. And so how do we know it? We know it by reclaiming language. We know this by reclaiming land. We know this by reclaiming our relationship to the land. How do we understand that? I bring you with forward to you the next image. This is, of course, uh, in the heart of the Peruvian Andes. And it's the Urubamba Valley, which is known as the Sacred Valley of the Incas. It's one of the largest hotspots of biological diversity. And for 3,000 years, the local Kuruba community have looked after the region's biodiversity. And it's a very complex relationship which I'm sure many colleagues at SKBU would understand between local people, 
species of plants, the ancestors, and ecosystems. And it's a very sophisticated system of knowledge and in innovation. And it's rooted in an um, understanding and a devotion towards what's known as Panchamama or Mother Earth. And it's also a home for many Andean crops, which are food crops such as quinoa, lima beans, peppers, yuca, or manioc, squash, and maize, different kinds. And it's also one of the regions for potato and is largely known for the cultivation of these plants. All right. The next image that I will bring forward for you, and you can always let me know at any point if you love, this of course is the bison. And as you will remember, a lot of communities in North America specifically depended upon the bison. Depended upon the bison, the, and the process was, the, uh, it was respect towards the bison, and it was also respect towards the bison's meat. And of course, there was a very symbiotic relationship of nurturing between the bison and the communities there. For example, the Blackfoot communities there, or even, for example, the Mipi. But in the 19th century, with European settlers, European colonization, there was a decimation of bison. Now, what happens is, this, and it was like the decimation of an iconic symbol, a symbol that spoke about the identity of indigenous communities during that period. And this led to a complete eradication of different indigenous communities in North America. It also led to the decimation of the bison. So this is also a moment in time that we need to reconnect our relationship with animals around us, animals, beings, and other people around us. The, and it's also a moment to reconnect with animals. Think about, I mean, if students out here, they will remember the kind of viral images of animals that we saw living during the lockdown. The viral images of animals on the street while humans were locked down in their cages. And it will give you a turning point of understanding what we are talking about. The next is, of course, the lockdown led to different forms of hardship, but it also brought us back, helped us revisit certain ideas and certain ways of knowing what this is and what is the idea of the community. And for example, over here, I have a picture of Pramila Sahu, who is from Devgar's Kanta Bahal village in Orissa, and she's walking out with a basket of mushrooms. So just when supplies were denied and supplies were stopped, these communities went back to the forest that they have living in. So the forests are what they talk about and what Pramila tells us in an interview is that we can't think of a life without the forest. It's not only part of a life, but it also protects us from difficulties. These are again pictures of, for example, tamarind and other in industries that were brought into focus because of this. It's, it's also unique that one needs to, in a moment of the pandemic, as per, per se, is not something, as Peter was saying a while ago, is not something that was foreign to indigenous communities. Indigenous communities historically have had to dealt with many forms of the pandemic, many forms of genocide through a long history of civilization. It's also a moment that I would take because maybe we that we mentioned Northeast, the initial stages of the pandemic had, had led to a certain xenophobic attitude for people from the office towards in the rest of uh, mainland India. There was this incident in Delhi where uh, a particular young student was spat upon by uh, people, two men going on a bike because they thought that she was, she, because they thought first of all to be spat upon by somebody is not acceptable, but they, it was first spat upon because the assumption was that this person is, uh, is, and she was labeled as Corona because she did not look uh, did not look like the rest of India because of her Mongolite features, she was marked out. Now, this, this kind of inherent racism was also something that one needs to be wary about. And how does one need to be wary about? One needs to be wary about not only by practicing an understanding of different communities, but also actually looking at the utility and to look at 
the agency that these communities have in different parts of India. And these cases of Pramila Sahu or this young woman, this other woman who was there is a case in point. It also led, and that brings me to the next image. Next image is, of course, uh, pictures of the relationship of indigenous communities to different forms of farming, different forms of uh, subsistence. So, for example, what we have over here is a cultivation of the tendu leaf, and the other one is the mahua, and which is tendu leaf, as we know, is called the golden leaf because it's one of the most important forest products and is one of the highest revenue generating potential product. Now, of course, with the extension of the lockdown, what has happened is, is, is a detrimental loss in terms of industry, but it has also led to rethinking the relationship that these people have with these communities and different ways of understanding. What's also more important over here is the relationship that these forms of farming have had for our industry, for our uh, for our well-being. It's also a moment to understand that how different forms of climate change and biodiversity or ecological, uh, what's known as environmental racism, it has it have led to this position that we are in right now. COVID-19 is not an overnight process. Had we heard or had we taken cognizance of indigenous knowledge systems, of, of, of ways of their relationship with nature, ways of their relationship of what's known as all my relations, relation with each and every part of being that one exists, then we would probably have not faced this pandemic as we are facing today. It's, it is in many ways a lack of an understanding of climate change, a lack of understanding of the richness of biodiversity that has led to this particular situation. It is also uh, sometimes a little difficult to talk about indigeneity because indigeneity seems to go hand in hand with an idea of patronization, as in that we are doing this for the community. What we forget when we make that statement is that we forget the fact that the community has its own agency, has its own ways of functioning, has its own ways of dealing with a certain way of life. And that, I think, is very important. A a webinar is not just another ethnographic exercise. A webinar is an exercise which helps us to deal with modes of representation, deals with modes of authenticity, and also helps us recognize our own limitations with respect to dealing with indigenous studies. The limitation, if we try to understand the limitations with respect to indigenous studies, that uh, with respect to our ability to enter into indigenous studies. I don't think that is a problem, but what is important, it helps us recognize the politics of representation as well as the solidarity of representation. I will end with the final Im image over here. And this is an image from Chhattisgarh, where a lot of people who were coming, a lot of migrant workers who were coming in, and this is in uh, South Bastar in Chhattisgarh, and these are people who were returning from Telangana. And after they had finished uh, plucking chilies, and they were there as pluck plucking chilies, and they were asked, and after they returned, they were asked to stay on the borders of the state for 14 days. So they were asked to be quarantined and all shelters were arranged and villages not only provided them with shelter, but they also provided them with food, but did not allow them to enter before they had completed the quarantine period. So what I'm trying, it actually this image proves the point that I'm trying to make is that we don't speak for indigenous communities. Indigenous communities can speak with themselves. They can speak for themselves and they can have their own agency towards building a sense of well-being. The, the COVID-19 pandemic is one of these moments when we realize that indigenous people have the best track record in dealing with pandemics, in dealing with situations 
where they are in balance with nature and very complex knowledge systems. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions as the discussion continues. Thank you very much. Nivedita, if you could take over. Thank you, Devoshri. Okay, so Devoshri again has brought out another very important aspect of this indigenous study. In fact, I will be saying two things. One is the we cannot be the voice for the indigenous people. They have their own agency. They have their own voice, and we must give them that space because they, you know, they are more at ease. We think. They are actually, we think that we can actually be speaking about them or we think, in fact, I will be speaking about the villages in uh, Purulia district that have been marked as backward villages. But why? Why backward? Not because they actually, the in fact, the parameters of terming something as backward is to be questioned over here because you know what we consider as being forward marching towards a technological world has really put a question mark to the very living of mankind today all right and these indigenous people who live in close collaboration with nature they can tackle the situation much better so Deboshri has been speaking about the, that and Peter, who has his experience from his own community and the other communities, has been referring to this. So now I come to a point actually where I will be speaking about what SKBU has been doing Shidhu Kanu Bidsha University. Again, the name is extremely interesting because it is named after three great leaders belonging to the indigenous community. Shidhu Murmu, Kanu Murmu and Bidsha Munda. All right, three people who dared to fight. And in fact, in a recent when I was studying for another webinar and uh, I was about to speak for uh, actually I was about to speak about Torone Rodhika all right uh, by Mahasheta Devi over there I found it extremely interesting that when Virshamunda says that he actually studied in a missionary school. All right. He was brought up in a missionary school with a westernized concept. But when he comes back to his native village, he comes back to his roots, he realizes that this forest belongs to him. He does not need to ask permission of the British in order to get his right for the forest. And you know, over there in the introduction, it is very well written, rights of the forest, when we translate it in English. That is the translation that came out. Now, rights of the forest, whether it is the forest has its own right. All right, the right to exist, something we have been defying all these years in India, especially with the growing population, actually, we had been, you know, we had been eroding this forest system. All right, houses, we needed people to build houses to live in and the forests were being destroyed completely. I have been seeing in all these areas that there used to be miles and miles of forest lands. Now the kind of the cities have gone into the forest and the cities have widened their spheres and as a result the forests have been eaten up. And another thing is the right which these indigenous people have to the forest. All right. They have lived in collaboration with the forest. Now, this university, Shidukanu Birsha University, it gave me really, it opened up new corridors to my study of the indigenous communities in various aspects.
In fact, I was working on a project known as Folklores and Folk Voices, Conserving the Environmental Ethnospace. I was trying to read into, obviously, the various, uh, you know, the various folk voices of Purulia Bakura district, referring to Jumu, referring to uh, referring to Tushu, referring to Bhadu songs, all these things, they actually have a close reference to nature, how nature can be conserved, and that is extremely essential. And Shidoka Nubisha University, if we go to the home page of the website. In its very basic statement of its mission, it has written that it desires to open up the avenues of indigenous study of indigenous language as well as culture. In keeping with this, our department, our university has a department of Santali the language of the Santhals of this area. We have a department of anthropology and tribal studies. And of course, we have our indigenous center. All right, where a lot of research is being done about all these things. Now, very recently, Shidukanu Bisha University, when the pandemic broke out, you know, it was a dire situation for all of us. And in order to understand this, we must understand the population base of Purulia district. The forest studies of West Bengal government has recently pointed out that Purulia has the second largest indigenous population in West Bengal. So a large number of people who are actually belong to the people who actually belong to the proto australoid group and they comprise of not one section of the indigenous, the Santhals, the Bhumis, the Mundas, the Swabors, the Birhors, all these different tribes. Now, all these different communities, they, of course, they had their own knowledge system to fall back on when the pandemic came, but they kind of needed some external agency to bring them to that or rather to help them whatever external help they required. And that is where the different departments of the indigenous of the of Shiduka Nubisha University started doing. The work that this university did in relation to the indigenous communities can actually be divided into three categories. One, on one hand, there was the immediate intervention. So immediately, what was needed? We all know that when the lockdown was declared, following the declaration of pandemic by the WHO, there was a shortage in the market. We were not really ready for it. India has a huge population. All right. So whenever something is needed, it is ne needed in billion and billion and trillions. All right. So the first thing that went out of the market was hand sanitizers. And it was the need of the day. So the Department of Chemistry and Bot Botany, they started working with the faculty members and the scholars, the students, and they started preparing hand sanitizers following the directives of the World Health Organization and comprising of aloe vera extract and lemongrass oil the self-help groups of these villages. I told you all, 994 villages in Purulia have been termed as backward villages. So I have a lot of reservation regarding this terming. All right. So 
these villages they of course had their self help groups and as we know those of us who are following the pandemic closely we know that especially in societies like india all right it is the women who are the main caregivers both at home and outside so we started the our scholars started involving these the women of the self help groups they were give we actually circulated certain videos regarding the preparation of face masks the pre preparation of face shields and these women they took to it very easily so on one hand it was providing the essential item and on the other hand it was also a means of income however meager that might be all right and we must remember that the situation was very grave in this juncture because with the lockdown whatever little and little you know whatever little employment was available to these villagers that came to a standstill all right of course they had their tk the traditional knowledge system to fall back on but you know when you are used to one particular system when you are used to following as everyone is doing you have also somewhat forgotten your roots all right so what the next thing we started doing is thinking of the health and nutrition needs of these people all right so as deboshri was saying also the nutrition and the health needs it is again back to nature all right along with the ayush department we started working on actually the we started preparing some herbal concoctions which comprises of turmeric ginger then ashwagandha basil and all these things and we start in a new initiative known as the immunity village initiative so these were distributed amongst the villagers and they were not just given the finished products they were given the rhizomes of ginger and uh, they were given the rhizomes of turmeric and ginger they were provided with the seeds of ashwagandha basil all these things and they started cultivating so again they were producing what they actually needed there was no external help needed actually we just remind we just needed to provide them those seeds or what they actually maybe some technical help where crop production is uh, concerned but the we think in last 3 months we are progressing to a place we are together progressing to a place where they can become self sufficient where these herbals are concerned all right but the problem was bigger than that we have to think beyond the pandemic and we have to plan beyond the pandemic and as deboshri again spoke about the migrant laborers all right the pandemic actually when livelihood is concerned for the general people as well as the indigenous people because you know i don't really believe in looking at the indigenous people at something you know something different from the mainstream i think them to be as much a part of the mainstream as the other public so when they started working actually there was a loss of livelihood and the return of the migrant laborers multiplied this many times all right so we have to plan for another employment something which will provide them what they need that is food and it will provide them the resources to produce that food and they will be able to be 
self sufficient this is where actually this you know this is where actually we started skbus workers started especially the sti hub of skbu started functioning they were given whatever little technological help they needed they could have done without it i know that but as times are bad they were just given those tools made aware of those tools and they took to it quite easily there was something known as vib nimpit app that provides them with information regarding the weather the soil health the pest problems certain ideas about the market trends of the crops and they were also told about the fisheries you know the fisheries that could be the fish you know the pisciculture that they could actually take recourse to because in the villages there were a number of ponds that could be used for this so in this manner actually skpu function and the department of science and techno the ministry of De science and technology its special division known as seed which is science of equity empowerment and development has acknowledged whatever work we have been doing in special relation to the indigenous people and in their handbook covid-19 resilience and capacity building of schedule caste and schedule tribes they have spoken about all the work done by shidukanu vishya university but again as i said we were providing them very very little it all existed within their knowledge system within their own awareness of nature and i can today say the situation is if i won't say really better at least we are looking at a future you know we are looking for a silver lining so with this i would like to hand it over to all of you you know devushri if i can uh, just um, butt in a little bit devushri talked about the politics of representation so yeah. that that is something that has always intrigued me you know when i came over i mean i grew up in darjeeling over there you have one kind of a tribe and then i came over for a job in purulia which has another kind of indigenous culture now um, uh, it's very easy to look at the entire scenario from outside and when you talk about the politics of representation it reminded me of what uh, you know gayatri chakravarti sriva talks about you know there are two kinds of representation one is darstellen and the other is vartratan so vartratan is when the indigenous people talk their hearts out they talk about themselves and the and when we talk about them not being indigenous people talking about indigenous people that's a completely different ball game i don't know how much uh, successfully it is possible to represent uh, an indigenous community from outside because uh, when we learn when it, of course there is no two way about the fact that we want to learn about them we want to help them out but how much is it possible for us to learn about them not living their life not standing in their boots the basic factor is that we have homes which are different from them we are we have family structures which are different from them we have relationship structures which are different from them food cultures are different from them everything is different and is it really possible for us to represent them to the t or is it better for us to somehow find out a way to enable them them so that they can represent themselves so we have we are trying in our own way to you know get the indigenous people more into the mainstream so that they can uh, you know learn the language of the world outside that community so that they can go back to their community and represent themselves in the language that the world understands we have also done one more thing 
that is uh, you know uh, since the pandemic struck and we were all you know we were we were kind of like obliged to rely on the on the internet and all that now there were there were loads of problems about internet connectivity in the in the rural areas and students would call us up and say ma'am we just can't listen we can't hear we can't attend the lectures because we don't have internet so what our university also did is they started a radio system so we yes, would uh, yeah. record record our lectures and we would uh, air it i don't know whether shudip is still there but shudip uh, the the person who is the coordinator of uh, indigenous studies center he used to um, you know coordinate this also so we would record the lectures we would send it to him and there was this um program called shikhangon so uh, the 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 things the recordings the of lectures used to be aired there so that even if you don't have internet you can just uh, you know tune into fm and listen to it so we have been trying and like nivedita said that there have been a lot of activities going on and a lot of activities that skbu has been trying to enable the uh, indigenous community so that they can stand up for themselves you know if, instead of really helping them out we can help them one day we can help them two days we can help them for two years but how long can we continue that way so we thought that it would always be better with if we could help them to help themselves so that is what shidukanu has been trying to do and, and let's uh, see how it works out and we did a very yeah and presently uh, they she detailed out uh, like uh, where this is concerned means i have problem where the very word help is concerned you know because are we really helping them i think because the world needs what we need is now to follow their way you know rather than they will be leading us to go back to nature because what we have been doing in all these years we have been destroying nature i feel I, pandemic i want to add something here yes 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yes yes uh, yes sorry to intrude uh, sorry to intrude i just want to add something here taking cue yes. from devotri's lecture the concluding comment that uh, we don't need to help uh, the aboriginal community or the tribal people they are very sufficient to cope up this pandemic situation i just want to add here that if we look at the customs uh, that was practiced by the Sant santal people say for example if you if if one uh, member of the santal community goes to the house of another member of the community now way they used to uh, receive the man is very interesting they will uh, allow him to wait outside their uh, premises they will bring some water and some herbs in this water then they will wash their hand and feet and after that they will uh, be taken to the in our premises not exactly in the room but what we call uthon uthon uh, yes okay. and uh, the initial conversation took place there after that they are only allowed to enter the proper home the innermost part so this is the way they used to deal with the people and this particular gesture is very akin to our process of sanitization Though we are using certain kind of sanitizer, though it looks very modern, but the inherent culture that we are practicing has It's some very, very okay. enlightening. <laughs> Rather, we must learn from them all these rituals. We we need to learn it. <coughs> This is number one. Uh, the question of helping and something, I I I think it should be very. mutual it should be a symbiotic process symbiotic relationship yeah. we, we, we need yeah. to, we need to learn from them and if you look at the statistics when when lockdown was declared in india you know west bengal uh, at least for initial one or two months purulia 
some parts of the Bakura and some parts of the Medvedu, which was mainly inhabited by three tribal populace, it was a contentment region. There was no contentment. Yeah, absolutely. There was no contentment. Yeah, right, right, right. How they did it is very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, well, uh, the density of the population was very low, I cannot but the uh, way they were, uh, they, 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 they are answered, it was very interesting. It was a viral picture uh, came in social media that some of them uh, built a mark with, with, with lips, with faces yes. yes. or yes. yeah. lips. Eclipse. They, 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 they have their own system to deal with that. Yeah. Uh, we 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 must learn from them also. Well, I I, I, I also place the initiative taken by our university by making immune villages or self-sufficient villages that uh, have been pointed out by university. But at the same time. I feel that we are in a favorable position in which we are trying to help them. Not we are ready to learn from them. So yeah, it, that it, is should be a, it should be a mutual process of actually all, that I know, all their culture out. needs to come out to the open. People need to know more about them. Like uh, when you're talking about, uh, like Jyoti was talking about how they welcome people and that is a kind of veiled way of sanitization first and then you come into the precincts of my home. Or they have their own ways of making masks with leaves. Half of the world doesn't even know that the indigenous people have all these treasures already there, inherent in them. So maybe what we could do is we could bring that out into the open so that people know about it. You know, it needs to come out into the open, not can contained I, within them. Can I just make uh, a comment? Yeah, sure. uh, of course. Uh, uh, in regard to what ma'am just said, uh, uh, you know, coming out with, uh, you know, the indigenous ideas and the beliefs and customs, there's a problem that, that is associated with it, and that is stigma. A lot of stigma is attached to the indigenous cultures and, um, you know, the traditions and beliefs. The mainstream often looks down on those cultures and traditions, which is uh, why not until, you know, we have met with this dire situation that we, uh, you know, thought about looking back uh, and, uh, you know, uh, examining and observing their uh, cultures and traditions and actually realizing that they are probably much more relevant and probably more eco-friendly than, you know, what we have been doing. Uh, so, I, I mean, uh, I think um, we also need to work um, towards mitigating this stigma that is associated with, um, uh, you know, a lot of the indigenous practices that, uh, you know, uh, is carried out and practiced. That's, uh, and that stigma, I think, to a lot of, uh, to a huge extent, comes from what we know as education. So edu the educated people and the others who are so-called uneducated. But there is, we need to understand that there is a huge amount of difference between qualification and education. Qualified people are not always educated and cultured. <laughs> Culture and education is inherent in human beings, in the inherent in our tradition, which we need to be open-hearted enough to reach out to and understand. I think that's fact, one lesson uh, we need to give ourselves. I think Deboshree and Peter will uh, agree with me. A term is often used in Australia, in US, some areas, aborigines. aborigines right. yes. I have a lot of problem with that term aborigines, meaning not original. But mm -hmm. mostly these are the people who, who are, are the who original are the inhabitants <laughs> of the land. This, yes. you know, I found it very strange when I started working for a UGC project on Australian, uh, uh, these Austra the indigenous, a particular indigenous group of Australia. And I found it extremely strange because they were, and another problem which I found, I think uh, I spoke with P 
Peter about this when we were traveling to Bakura, that is from Durgapur. It was an hour journey. And Peter, I think this stigma should have been spoke of. This stigma is not there in New Zealand. All right. Peter said over there, the Maori community and the other communities, they are very much mainstream people. All right, they have scientific advancement and at the same time they preserve their own culture. So this stigma is something I think related to India. And another thing I noticed, I noticed some of you will agree with me, the Santhals and people belonging to these groups, they have the facility of coming up in society. A section of them get highly educated, they get good job, but they don't want to return to the community. They rather prefer to stay in the cities and live like uh, in the city and completely become oblivious of their group. That I think is a problem where we want these people to go back and speak for their own selves. All right. Because they become a kind of, you know, I don't know. I will be thinking of in terms of uh, Fano. All right. Something like that. They are actually taking up a garb. All right. A different, you can see a mask. They are wearing a different mask. They don't really want to go back to their community and speak about it. Use whatever tools they have learned to bring out the best aspects of those communities which in fact we need to learn from they both I think free. that again yeah. you know that again reverts back to the stigma that um, Shrobi was talking about and that uh, that uh, social condition the psychosocial conditioning of othering you know mm. that they are the uh, subaltern so mm. that idea of subalternity and that idea of uh, the hegemony of the so-called other educated people has been so ingrained in them that even the you know uh, the indigenous people who come out of their indigeneity and uh, come out into the so-called mainstream again a very uh, very dubious term so-called mainstream they do not want to go back there because it's also drilled psychosocially into their uh, psyche that what they are going back to is the other, what they are going back is the upper subaltern. So they should not really, so it's kind of like a demotion for them to go back to their right. community. Right. So right. it's a kind of colonization of the mind, I guess. Right. Like what uh, Hyongo said, a colonization of the mind, which needs to be, uh, you know, gotten rid of first. Okay, I think Jyoti, we should be asking for questions if the listeners have any questions, have any questions. or anything. Because for Peter, it is getting night, I think. We, for us, it's morning. Okay, we are going towards the noon, but Peter, I think it is, is yeah. almost sleep time. All right, <laughs> okay. Any questions? Uh, so far, there are no questions. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, so, so I think uh, if we have uh, no issues right now, there it's time to conclude. Maybe, maybe. Uh, there's something, uh, some final remarks from Peter and from Deboshri. Oh uh, yeah, um, Peter. Okay. Yeah, you go. Go. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. No, I think some of the points that were raised by Jyoti and Shirobi and also Professor Hajra, I think they make sense because one is, of course, uh, as for example, in one of the problems that we have is probably because there are so many communities, so many indigenous communities, and it becomes really difficult to start. In New Zealand, of course, one saw street signs which had Maori in, in different languages. We don't have it over here at different points of time. Mm. Who is also 
yes this idea of presentation is very important of course when, uh, one of the first things that i try to tell my students when we come is that if i see the word try being used in any of your papers i'm going to throw that paper now why do i tell yeah. them this because i i yes the word try is a constitutional term but i also think that one needs to recognize the word try in terms of community and how do you understand the idea of community and for them to specify the name of the community and to historicize the community becomes very important to me and also because and i also tell them you call bengali is a tribe so and they are fluxed by that question because that's not a question that they are ready to answer so this becomes one of the things and also going back to what aprajit had said is this is idea is ye manifold a salish right for one said that you need to travel in my moccasins to know the world so you know that it becomes a particular challenge i mean one of the things that i always tell people is that when we grew up listening reading english classics and other aspects nobody told us what a daffodil would be looking look like nobody in india for a long long time had any idea what daffodils were we looked at mustard seeds and thought they were daffodils and we were happy with that idea so but the whole idea is so that it so if nobody explained that to us so it doesn't mean that an indigenous community needs to explain itself to us it is for us to educate ourselves i think the one of the very important points mentioned by aprajita dev was this whole idea of what you mean by education and also how do you break into stereotypes of education going back to shurobi i think you can break stigma when you're able to break the stereotypes being perpetuated through education perpetuated through education do you brings about this whole idea of sanitizer it's right there in front of us yeah. and it's just to recognize it and to understand which is why i think escape is very uniquely placed because it reminds me of the center which is there in british columbia it's called the eloquent center it was brought out in, it was founded in 1989 the eloquent center in pentic Done, and it was brought out as part of the Okanagan community there. And a lot of things happened. It talked about indigenous communities speaking for themselves, writing for themselves. Started with the creative school of writing. And I think SKB is doing a lot of work on those lines, situated as they are, because location is very important. There's an immediacy of location, access to local communities, and access to local communities which not necessarily be read, read as suspicious as field work. because we work within the world of indigeneity is a very suspicious word to use we all do field work but it's very suspicious if we try to appropriate their story it's yeah. not an appropriation appropriation so for example an indigenous center can look into thawdas it can look into the earliest origins of these communities and i think that helps us in a way and i think it's also possible i don't know but this is kind of not my place to say but and i was hoping that peter could help us with the singing part as well yeah so, yeah right yes right. yes and i think yes. he was up to roses up that is his wife is up also but yeah 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 that would be a very nice thing to start by saying that because i don't know because rose has always a very busy schedule is it okay yes <laughs> yep, I just want to pick up on a, a point that Deborah she said about the the term tribe. Um and one of the issues for indigenous communities around the world is that um outsiders have wanted to name them and ask them who they are. and what the language is and they've always known that that they belong to a people but sometimes it's this not often a name for their group or a name for their language because it, it's just been the default of what they use and and but um they'll always have a term for talking about outsiders and those that aren't part of their community will be um terms here so this this is something that you need to be careful of when you go around the world um do you use the term indigenous do you use the term first nations um do you use some particular if you think about in north america 
a lot of the North American Indian tribes are, are named after French terms or Spanish terms. No, we're, we're not the Navajo. We're Neth, uh, because that, that's how, and so I kind of think that that's um, that kind of self-identification, that that kind of naming thing. Um, how we're going to call our language is, is something that um, we need to be aware of. Um, and even New Zealand, we the word Maori to describe the people in New Zealand. That's very very recent. That uh, that's and so that's um, something that um, is is new. Um, Um, so, yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed the discussions. Um, I've been very fortunate because um, one of the things that um, when you ask your um, wife to do something, um, you, you may not necessarily um, get the, uh, the right answer or if you do something, <laughs> Really, um, she um, may say that, that. Why didn't you warn me? But um, I'm fortunate that um, I've given her a bit of warning, and she's here now. Um, and just Hi, to Rose. Hi, uh, Hi. they can hear Hi, you. Rose. You can say something. Hi. <laughs> she just said. Uh, Hi, everybody. Okay, we're going to sing a song, and I'm going to... Yeah, we are waiting for that. Song, um, I'm going to uh, also, yeah. Hello, Michael. Uh, um, is, is a, a, it's a simple song, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get rather than me sing it, I'll get her to sing it. Rose. Rose to sing it, and, um, yeah. and... And she'll get the tune better than me because quite often when you sing a song, it's up to the best singer to set the tune and those that, that can follow can follow. Um, so this, and it, it's a song, it's actually a Maori version of a, a biblical song. It's called um, So um, we'll sing it right through and then we'll sing it um, a line in Māori and then a line in English so you can understand what's being, being said. So, e toru ngā mia, ki anā te pai pera, whakā whanu tū manāko. Ka whai? Hello. Okay, so e toru ngā mia. E toru ngā mia, ngā mia nunui, e ki anā te pai pera, whakā puno. Tu mana ko, ko te manui, ko te aroha. Okay. Uh, on my line. Ki toru ngā mea. There are three things ngā mea nunu, that are very important. E ki ana. It is said by the Holy Bible. Whakaapuno. Faith. Tu mana ko. Hope. Ko te manui. But the greatest thing ko te aroha. is love. Thank you. That's great. That was wonderful. It was really good. Yeah, yeah wonderful. Was good. wonderful. I mean, I had heard Peter sing this earlier, but hearing his wife sing it, it's a greater pleasure. I must say. Yeah, that. I mean, I mean, thank you so thank much you. for this. This was a treat for the years. Yeah. And the senses as well. And the words were so. Wonderfully poignant. I mean, oh, beautiful. Yeah. beautiful. And we must thank Deboshri for this. She has brought all. Yeah, and she brought it out again. <laughs> yeah, she brought it all together. Yes. So because I've heard uh, Rose uh, singing uh, when she was cooking in her kitchen. So, I mean, look at it. I'm going to head, so kind of I know that. Uh, Peter's daughter is also somebody who's been learning this. She's a teenager now. She is so. So this was something that I knew about it, and it's also because I've seen them perform, and I've also realized that uh, Peter has always been telling me two things: is that, and that's I think why we are friends. Is one, he tells me that all Maori is a great singer. So I tell him all Bengalis are great singers. Then he tells me that I'm not a great singer, and I say I'm not a great singer too. 
<laughs> so I think we are not singing well at all. So, but the point is that we know people who sing well, which is yeah. of course from the communities that we belong to. So, yeah, and it's also very integral to various ceremonies which also happen in Auckland in the university itself and related to every part of life, which is also I think something that's very important. I think in terms of actually looking at indigeneity in terms of how it exists in practice rather than in a theoretical basis. That's right. Absolutely. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So, uh, Shurabi, will you deliver the vote of thanks? Vote of thanks. Vote of yes. thanks. And before that, uh -huh. I just hope this is just the beginning. Both Peter yes, and absolutely. And uh, our Jodi Madam, Yoti, Shurabi, and all our students and listeners, I just hope we will have many, many more such interactions. Absolutely. All right. No Thank doubt about you. that. And uh, oh. before Shurabi goes into the official uh, vote of thanks, I really want to thank, you know, Nibedita is our own guy. So I'm not thanking <laughs> her uh, separately, but uh, Ushri <laughs> and Peter. Thank you so very much for making this so successful. I mean, when uh, you, you you were slated to come on, I know I knew that this would be good, but this good. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you very much. And many more and, to come. Shurabi, and over for time. adding that personal touch. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, the idea of indigeneity is that you're supposed to be able to share a meal together and then you can actually work. We can't share a meal, but we share a song. So I think that's right. 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 Okay. Um, it's my uh, privilege to have been asked to deliver the vote of thanks for this occasion today. Uh, so, on behalf of the Department of English, Shidhokanabesha University, I would firstly extend my heartfelt thanks to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Deepak Kumar Kaur who is constantly inspiring and encouraging us. And without his support, nothing would have been possible. Um, I would also like to thank our respected registrar, Dr. Nochiketa Bondopadhyay, our uh, Dean of Arts, Professor, Professor Shonali Mukherjee, whose support is indispensable in all the uh, events that we actually uh, you know, uh, have organized. Uh, I would also like uh, to thank Professor Shudib Bhui, who's the coordinator of the Center for Indigenous Studies, and Professor Dhananjay Rukshit, uh, uh, the coordinator of IQAC. Um, and this entire panel discussion would not have been possible without the presence of our distinguished speakers, Dr. Peter Keegan from Auckland University, New Zealand, and okay. Dr. Devushri Dottarai um, from Jadapur University, who took time out of their busy schedules to be, as with us to, uh, to be with us today and share their valuable insights in indigenous yes. studies, especially in the, you know, the times of the coronavirus. Uh, we have greatly benefited from your lectures and the lively discussion that followed the lectures. And thank you, uh, Peter, sir, and Rose, ma'am, for your song. It was a lovely, lovely uh, okay. uh, gift to us all. Um, last, uh, also, uh, before the, uh, you know, going on to Oprajita, ma'am, uh, Nivedita, ma'am, thank you so much. Uh, you have been, you are the woman behind the scenes, you know, pulling all the strings, <laughs> coordinating everything. Uh, thank you so much for, you know, uh, uh, making us a part of this uh, beautiful event. And lastly, uh, I would like to thank Professor Oparajita Hajra, our HOD. She is the pillar of support. She is always <laughs> encouraging us, <laughs> always there behind us. And and last, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Jyoti Shankar Mondal Jyotida, who is always there. Uh, should we, uh, are you online? <laughs> Please be online on time, <laughs> managing <laughs> all the liquidities and the technical aspects of everything. And lastly, and most importantly, I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to all the participants and the students who were there, and without whom this discussion, this panel discussion, would not have been successful at all. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, uh, everyone. Thank you a lot. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Devushri. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Every, I thank, thank everybody you, from the bottom of my heart. So uh, without this, you know, this feels like 
uh, the old days once again you know when we were offline and we would sit uh, the only yes. thing that i'm missing is that grand gala dinner or the ga grand gala lunch that we have together but then, I can't have anything. We have to try. We have to try to get this recording on YouTube, Jyoti. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that more so Jyoti is our IT guy. You're Jyoti about. He's our IT guy. He is always my IT right hand. So uh, this thing, Jyoti, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I get that you know a lot as well. So I actually know what it means. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. So Thank we are winding up now. Thanks Thank again, and many you. more to come. Many more. Thank you. Okay. 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 Okay.